Dylan's, I'd like you to look with me at the reactions of two men to the same provoking circumstances and see the difference between those reactions. Now, they're recorded in Luke 22, Luke chapter 22, and that's page 917, the ones in that RSV Bible, 917, Luke 22. You remember the context there was a group of armed guards moving towards Jesus and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 50 of Luke 22. And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And from the Gospel of John you find that that was Peter that did that. Peter struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. So, those were utterly different reactions. Uh, Peter returned blow for blow and Jesus returned love for hatred. And the reaction of Jesus is the normal reaction. Now, this is amazing, dear ones. The reaction of Jesus is the normal reaction for any man or woman in whom the uncreated life of God flows. And that's right. The reaction of Jesus is the normal reaction for any man or woman in whom the uncreated life of God's Spirit flows. And the reaction of Peter is the subnormal reaction. This is why you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks those very high moral imperatives so calmly and quietly. I mean, he's really amazing, isn't he? He just says it just quietly and all. Yet, if you have two coats, you have to give one to your neighbor. And if somebody strikes you on one cheek, you have to turn the other. He says it in full belief that the people listening to him are able to do that. You note in the Sermon on the Mount, he isn't exhorting them and saying, now do your best, try hard, strain, because this won't come naturally to you. He's obviously just making quiet, ethical directives about something that the people listening to him will have no trouble living up to. Now, you can get that if you... Look really at the Sermon on the Mount at Matthew 5 there and 44 to 45. Obviously, Jesus believes that these are not laws at all, these things that he's giving. To a man who has died to self and been filled with the Holy Spirit, these are just easy directives that he finds it simple to obey. And obviously, Jesus expects them to obey them without a great deal of strain or striving. Matthew 5 and 44 and 45. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You can see underlying Jesus' whole attitude is the assumption that we who have God's life flowing through us will find no great difficulty in obeying these things. Because, of course, Jesus is banking on the fact that we ha will have been filled with a supernatural life that itself wants to do these things. Now, the subnormal state uh, that most human beings live in is described in Romans 7 and 19. And we've referred to it several times. Romans 7 and 19. This is the subnormal state, page 982, that most human beings live in. Romans 7 and 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. 
Now, I think that's the normal state of most human beings. They respond to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount with the feeling, oh, I want to do it, but I can't do it. And yet Jesus is obviously giving those directives on the understanding that, you look, you won't have any trouble doing this. It'll come naturally to you. Now, I think what's important for us this morning to see is that even though Peter and Jesus differed in their reaction, yet neither of them doubted that they should obey the law. Now, brothers and sisters, that, that's important if we're going to go on thinking about this this morning. That even though they differed in the reaction and the response, neither of them doubted that they should obey the law. Now, you'll see that if you look at Matthew 5, 17 to 20. That'll be Jesus' attitude. And then you can see Peter and Paul's attitude in another verse in Romans. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. So even though they differed in their response and the levels of their achievement, yet neither of them doubted that they should obey the law. Matthew 5.17 Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And Jesus obviously believes that he should obey the law. Now Romans 7, you'll see that old Paul, and presumably Peter with him, even in the midst of his defeat, does not doubt at all that he should obey the law. Romans 7 and verse 7. It's page 982. 982. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. And Paul says, oh no, the law isn't bad. It's not something to despise. And verse 12, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. So even old Paul, you know, in the midst of that chapter where he describes what defeat is like in the Christian life, he says, yeah, I have no question in my own mind, I'm supposed to obey the law. Now, dear ones, there are two phrases that describe the reactions of Peter and Jesus. You remember, Jesus' reaction was, he obeyed without any trouble. It was as if there was something inside him that wanted to love the guard that was coming at him with a sword. Whereas old Peter, he had a reaction inside him that made him want to strike off the ear of the guard. Now there's a, a name, you remember, and a phrase that we used last Sunday to uh, label those two re reactions. And it's in Romans 6 and verse 14. Romans 6 and 14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. It's those two phrases. Jesus was under grace, and Peter was under law. Now, do you see what that meant? Jesus had the grace of the life of God's Holy Spirit flowing through him, so he was able to obey the law effortlessly and easily. Whereas Peter did not have that within him, and he had to strive to obey the law on his own, by his own strength. Now that's the meaning of the two phrases, under the law and under grace. Both men are trying to obey the law, but one is doing it by the strength of the Holy Spirit of God's life flowing through him, and the other is trying to do it on his own. Now you may say, oh, brother, why make such a big point about it? Why labor it like this? Because, brothers and sisters, many of us are under the same misunderstanding about being under grace as the questioner of today's verse that we'll be studying. Many of us have the same misunderstanding about what being under grace is as this questioner. Maybe you'd look at the verse that we're studying today. It's Romans 6 and 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Now many of us have that kind of idea about being under grace. We kind of feel, you know, that being under law means that you have to obey the law in order to be accepted by God. But being under grace means 
that you ought to believe in Jesus and try to obey it, but if you can't, it doesn't matter. Now, really, I think most of us have that vague understanding in the back of our minds that being under law is we have a responsibility to obey the law, to be accepted by God, but if we're under grace, we ought to try to obey it and do the best we can, but if we don't, it doesn't matter too much. Now, loved ones, that's why I want to try to emphasize what being under grace and being under law is. Under grace is having the life of God's Holy Spirit flowing through you so that you can effortlessly fulfill God's requirements of you. Being under law is trying in your own strength to obey those requirements and failing to do it. But neither of them allow for an easy-going attitude to the law as if it really doesn't matter. And I'll try to make it clear why that's so a little later on. In other words, if you look at Romans 6 and 15, and you look at the question, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? The answer is really threefold. The first answer is in Jesus' own life. He was a man, the firstborn among many brethren, who experienced the life of God's Holy Spirit flowing through him, and yet he obeyed the law in every detail. So the first answer is in Jesus' own life. He was the firstborn among those who were born of the grace of God's Holy Spirit. And he obeyed the law. And you remember, uh, sinning is not obeying law. James 4 and 17 says, Whoever knows what is right and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And 1 John 3 and 4 says, Sin is lawlessness. So sin is not obeying the law. Now the question is, are we to sin? Are we not to obey the law? Because we are not under law, but under grace. The first answer is Jesus' own life. Jesus was under grace. He had the grace of God's Holy Spirit flowing through him, and yet he obeyed the law himself. The second answer is in Jesus' quiet assumption behind all his statements on the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew 5 and, and verse 38 to 42. Matthew 5 and 38 through 42. Page 839 it is. Matthew 5 and 38. Obviously, Jesus quietly assumes here, these are things that I want you to do, and you're not going to have any trouble doing them. I'm just giving you directives about them. This is a spirit that you will find coming up from within you if you have really allowed yourself to be crucified with me and have been filled with my Holy Spirit. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. They're all simple little directive stones. Not great exhortations to people who are going to have trouble doing this, but simple little directives. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. Now, brothers and sisters, Jesus loves us. And he wouldn't give us things to do that we are not able in the power of the Holy Spirit to do. He would not taunt us or torture us like that. And so when Jesus says words like this, it's important for us to take them seriously. In fact, Jesus goes further. He says that your reaction to the law kind of shows what your attitude to, is to his Father. And it really determines whether you will enjoy the presence of God in your life or not. John 14, if you look at it, uh, Judas, uh, not Iscariot, you, you remember, asked Jesus, now, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the rest of the world? How are we going to know you real in our hearts and our lives? And the rest of the world won't even be able to see you. And uh, Jesus gave this answer, it's page 939, 939, and John 14, and uh, verse 23. Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word. So Jesus says, If you really love me, you will keep my word. You will obey my words. You'll obey my laws. And as a result of your obeying my laws, my Father will love you, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Then Jesus emphasizes it by putting it in the negative form. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, so don't argue with that. 
but the fathers who sent me. And then, uh, brothers and sisters, Jesus brings home a a very stern uh, truth in Matthew 12. Uh, Matthew 12 and verse 36 and 37. And he brings home to us the fact that judgment day will depend to some extent on our attitude to God's law. Matthew 12 and 36 through 37. I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will render account for every careless word they utter. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And you can see that Jesus is saying there, on the judgment day, your words and your works will matter. Now, brothers and sisters, that ties in, you see, and it makes a harmony of the Bible if you go back to that question that Paul put in Romans. Are we to sin then because we are not under law but under grace? Obviously, the whole Bible is answering no, no. The whole purpose of coming under grace is so that you would be able to stop sinning, so that you would be able to obey the law, so that you would be able to please God. Now, dear ones, do you see that it's because of a misconception of God's law and God's grace. It's because of that misconception that so many of our generation are absolutely fed up with the kind of thing that we have in Watergate. It's because of the absolute hypocrisy in embezzling and lying among people who are supposed to know better that so many of our generation have begun to smile and be sarcastic about the things we call uh, moral values or the values of Christianity. It's because of this terrible misconception of the difference between God's law and God's grace that so many of our generation are fed up with religious hypocrites. With so many people in our churches who say they believe certain things, but who will not live that way. It's because of that terrible misconception that so many of us really live in defeat ourselves. Here's the misconception. People believe that God tried first the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. First he said, if you obey the Ten Commandments completely, I'll accept you into heaven with me. Then most people who have been brought up even in Christian churches believe that God saw that that wasn't working and that nobody, hardly anybody, was obeying the Ten Commandments and he saw he was going to have a bit of a flop on his hands so he decided, okay, I changed the whole thing. You don't need to obey the Ten Commandments. All right, I'll make it easier. Now you have just to believe in Jesus. doesn't matter about the Ten Commandments. Forget about that. Just believe in Jesus and I'll accept you. Now, brothers and sisters, that's an absolute parody of what the gospel is. The gospel isn't that at all. It isn't that God tried the Ten Commandments and then saw so many of us failing that he thought he'd better make it easy and tie it up to some mental belief or assent in Jesus. It is utterly different from that. And yet you know that so many of us have a tendency to believe that that is the truth, that Isn't it so we will almost be cynical and suspicious of any Christian who even attempts to say that he's obeying all God's laws? Isn't that true? We have become so used to that misconception of the gospel that if any Christian ever comes and says, well, God is giving me grace to obey his laws, we'll become a little cynical about him. And is it not that kind of cynicism about the possibility of obeying God's law that has allowed us to put the reputation of the president or the reputation of the nation beyond truth and honesty? In other words, has Satan not practiced upon us a tremendous double-take, a tremendous brainwashing, that has persuaded us to sit very easily by God's laws. Now, if you ask me, all right, if that's not the gospel, what is the gospel? I think it's very simple. 
God gave us physical and mental life at the beginning when he created us that would last for 70 or 80 years independent of him. But he also made available to us the uncreated life of his Holy Spirit. And that is the Spirit that flows through him and his Son. And whoever receives that life of that Spirit automatically becomes like God and like Jesus. We all refuse that Spirit. We resolve we live with the mental and emotional and physical life that you've given us. And we'll try to do what is right just on the strength of that. And we made that attitude so normal in our world that bit by bit we didn't think there was any other kind of life. By our own self-attitude that rejected God's life and opened the way to the power of Satan's poisonous life, we began to normalize that joyless, purposeless, powerless life to such an extent that suddenly there was no sign of what God's life would be like at all in the whole world. And for that reason, God listed the symptoms of that uncreated life. And he set it down in the laws of my life. And he said, look, if you only had received the life of my Holy Spirit, you would have no other gods before me. You would not steal. You would not commit adultery. You would not be jealous. You would not be boastful. And he gave those laws to show us that this is what my life of my Holy Spirit would produce in you if you'd only receive it. So even the giving of the laws, you can see, was really an expression of God's grace. He was anxious not to leave us completely, but to tell us, look, the normal life that you have made normal in your world is subnormal. The normal life that I wanted you to live is the life described in these laws. And then the next step was that instead of wiping us right out of the earth, he couldn't train our selfish wills to be better. He simply had to destroy them. And so he took all of us. And in eternity, which is outside time and space, he put us all into Jesus and destroyed those selfish wills of ours. And destroyed that old self-attitude that rejects his life. To give us another chance to receive the life of his Holy Spirit. And so, brothers and sisters, whenever you die to self with Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit, you find that the life of the Holy Spirit begins to reproduce the symptoms that are described in the Ten Commandments on the Sermon on the Mount. And so it is a natural, easy thing for us. In other words, the truth really is that when you live the life of grace, you come into a real liberty so that you can obey Jesus and obey God's laws. And then you find a new motive coming up within you because the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in your heart a love of God that gives you a new motive for obeying. So the question is ridiculous. Are we to sin because we are no longer under law but under grace? No. Law is just a list of the symptoms of the life that the Holy Spirit produces in you. And so once you're under grace and have begun to receive the life of the Holy Spirit, it is as impossible for you to act against law as it is for this Bible to fall upwards. It cannot fall upwards. The law of gravity says it has to fall down unless it gets outside the atmosphere of the earth. And unless you get outside the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for you to find within you a rebellion against God's laws. In fact, it is natural for you to find within you a desire to obey his laws. Why? Because the laws themselves are a description of the life of the Holy Spirit, and he is in you. Now, I know, brothers and sisters, that with many of us, we have for years been going against his laws. And it takes a while for some of us to get that old personality into the right ruts. But nevertheless, it is God's promise that we should come into a place where we will automatically obey these laws because of the life that is within us. So the question is now, never, you know, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? The fact is, sin is alien and unnatural to one who is under grace. I think I should stop bluntly and let you question. 
because there are lots of misunderstandings and misconceptions that I know we can have about the whole deal because I think we have listened to untruth for so long. Brother says, and I, I might go off on the question, brother, so bring me back if I do. Brother says, this kind of ties up with faith and works. And for instance, her, I, I, I think it, you said your mother, but I, yes, your mum was listening to Billy Graham and he was emphasizing faith, faith. And she kind of is anxious to go off in works. And I think many people in churches are anxious to kind of win their way into God's heart. I think the harmony of these positions is this, Jones that there will be no real works. There will be no real works that please God. Real faith works unless there is first a faith. Unless you are willing to be crucified with Jesus and to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there will be no faith that can produce works. But James is right as he says, faith without works is dead. And if you find that you have something you call faith inside and it isn't producing works, then you ought to examine not your works, but you ought to go back and examine your faith. And so the question is not, uh, are works necessary? Works are not necessary for salvation. We are accepted by God because of our belief in the blood of Jesus. But works will follow salvation. So, it's a question not are works necessary for our salvation to be accepted by God, but rather are works a result of salvation? And they are, of course. Faith produces works. James says, you show me your faith, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So, the faith is necessary in order to produce the works. But, brothers and sisters, what I've been trying to share this morning is that the works need to be there, you know. And if they're not there... We don't all shudder and get shook and say we're not Christians, but we do begin to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, have I allowed you to take over all of my life the way I should? Or is there some area of my life where I'm having trouble obeying God's law because I'm not letting you have your way? Brother is emphasizing, you know, that the reason for uh, sharing Jesus with each other is not just that we'll go to heaven and that very often that kind of hedonistic approach has been taken. That if you accept Jesus, you'll go to heaven and not to hell. And anyone, obviously, who is interested in insurance at all will pick Jesus just for their own selfish sakes. And it is important, I think, brothers and sisters, to see that the reason we share Jesus with each other is Jesus is truth. Jesus is reality. This is the way to live life. Any other way of living life is a lie. And life will not work if it's lived any other way. And the reason we should accept Jesus is because he is the creator's son. And we are, we are kicking the face of the creator if we refuse Jesus. I agree with you, brother, that the challenge ought always to be to accept Jesus because this is truth and this is reality. And that his life will reproduce in us the kind of life he himself lived. I I will promise, brothers and sisters, because I know there are a number, it is 12.10, you see, and there are a number who have lunch appointments of different kinds. So I think I should just take maybe one more question and then maybe the others could come up with me. So, uh, brother. Yes. Uh, Brother, you realize that it's a massive question, and so (laughs) I'm going to uh, indicate a direction that God has at last beaten through to me. It seems from uh, Matthew, uh, now, brother, somebody help me with that, but I thought it was Matthew 20 and 22, but can somebody give me, whoever divorces his wife except for the cause of adultery and marries another, Commits, causes the other person to commit adultery. On the basis of that, brother, I think you have to take the negative interpretation also that Jesus is permitting uh, a person who, uh, whose partner has committed adultery, he is permitting that person to divorce the partner and yet not be under guilt for it. And presumably be free to remarry, though many of us would have strong questions even about the remarriage. So to, uh, to summarize it, It seems to me the innocent partner in a divorce 
for unchastity is permitted by Jesus certainly to divorce. Now, whether there, and it would seem is permitted to marry from things that Paul says in Romans uh, about remarriage. Or if the non-Christian partner leaves them, then that fits in also to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that the person is permitted to let the non-Christian leave. So the innocent party is permitted to divorce in the case of the partner abandoning them or in the case of the partner committing adultery uh, or committing fornication. Uh, it seems that that's the situation. The whole remarriage situation, many of us hesitate on, but we do think that Paul means you're free to remarry because he uses the phrase, you are not bound. And it would seem that he's saying you're free not only to divorce, but to remarry. So the innocent party in a divorce, it seems uh, God permits them to take part in the divorce. But... Uh, uh, the other partner, and brother, I had to, and maybe the brothers and sisters are here, I don't know, but I had to refuse a brother and sister who wanted to marry each other, and they were now Christians, but they had committed adultery, and that was what caused the divorce, the original divorce. And even though I know God has forgiven them now, I don't believe for one moment he wants them to continue in that kind of action. So uh, I think one has to be very wise and careful. Brothers and sisters, I, honestly, I, I, I'm happily, I, don't get me wrong, I'm very happily married, but I don't see all this, if we're really given to Jesus, I don't see all this rush to run close to the line on remarriage. If you're married once and God has not succeeded in bringing it into blessing, then I think you really need to pray a lot before you marry again especially in these days. I think there's a lot to be done with God's time besides that. But I know that is, that is I say, not from the Lord. That is my own opinion. Yeah. Well, dear ones, will you, will you think and pray about some of the things that we shared? Because I really do believe that it's some of the reasons for people turning against Christianity and against church people are found in what we've shared this morning. So don't let's make excuses for ourselves. Let's pray. Dear Father, we know it is not your will for us to come under guilt. That, uh, that is just not your will at all. Because you have told us that guilt is something that Satan tries to bring upon us. Conviction the Holy Spirit brings. But guilt is what comes when we don't respond to the Holy Spirit's indications and directions. So Father, we know you do not want us to lie under guilt. You want us to get up to answer Satan by the blood of Jesus and to claim that we are justified by his blood. And yet, Father, we know that it is your will that the Holy Spirit who produced a flawless life in Jesus should be free to reproduce that life in us. And Lord Jesus, that's the kind of life we want. We want to be conformed to your image in every area of our lives. So, Holy Spirit, we trust you now. If there is any place where we're disobeying God's laws, that you will show us in what way we need to enter into a real death to self with Jesus in that area. And in what area we need to be filled completely with the Holy Spirit. Father, we would trust you to counsel each of us this coming week in regard to these things, that we may be epistles seen and read by all men. And that we may remind our friends and our acquaintances of Jesus because of the way we speak and the way we, the way we act. We ask this in his name. Amen.